I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. We purposely picked a time for our camping trip when we could pretty much choose from any spot we wanted, and for that reason, we chose the very end of summer. My wife took her vacation from the bank, and since I'm a self-employed plumber, I had enough work lined up for my crew that we would be comfortable being gone, and there was no cell phone reception within 15 miles of our spot. We had found it quite by accident, as we believed this area to be privately owned because it was adjacent to a private and secluded home that shared the same access road. The lake is small enough that it goes largely ignored except for the residents of the home up from the lake. There are only a small handful of visitors to the lake. We were driving around the area looking for access to federal land and just happened to enter this road one day when the owners were headed to town and we hit it off well enough that they explained that the lake was actually surrounded by public property but that most people just turned around and left when they saw the house and it appeared that the road was their driveway. The road actually went downhill after their driveway turned off. They purposely let the weeds and small shrubs grow without cutting as that effectively hid the lake completely unless you were in a vehicle like a 4x4 pickup and really stretched to see ahead. You would never know it was there. Most maps don't indicate that Summer Lake even exists as topographic maps make it look like a swamp with a stream running through it. In actuality, the stream flows out of the small lake, which is a beautiful, clear, spring-fed oasis with a depth of over 20 feet, and it's perfect for a quiet getaway and catching the occasional trout. While we first thought it would be swampy because of the rushes and cattails, we found it has a nice gravel shoreline around three-quarters of the lake. We have been spending our vacations here off and on for eight years now, However, we have had some unnerving events on the last three trips. The adjacent property owner would not want their names mentioned, but they have had even more trouble. This year was the worst yet. Three years ago, we did have more than a strange event when we had been on a hike in the neighboring National Forest. Upon returning to our camp, we found our tent had collapsed. The stakes had been pulled up one side, the screen flap at the entrance was torn, and the zipper pulled apart. A few of our snacks, like bags of chips and protein bars, had been ripped open and appeared they were chewed on. Our first thought was that the dog belonging to the property owners nearby had come over the hill, and we continued to make that assumption until we left at week's end. We stopped to say goodbye, and we mentioned this incident. They said their dog was confined to their property by the chain-link fence that surround their house and outbuildings, and the rest of the acreage was surrounded by three strands of barbed wire. We all assumed it could have been a bear, as they had found bear tracks on their property and in the upper meadows. Then, last year, we again made it to our favorite spot, and it appeared that we were now about the only people to have been there since our last vacation. That time, we brought our new dog with us. He was a golden retriever and just loves hikes and running in the woods, but my wife has refused to allow me to train him as a hunting dog. Rocky had a great time there. Of course, the first thing he did was dive right into the lake swimming in circles, diving down under the lily pads, and then climbing out and rolling in the grass. He was in heaven. The tough part was drying him off before he came in the tent at night, but he enjoyed himself so much we learned to sleep with the wet dog smell. We kept Rocky close to camp and often chained him to a tree when we wanted to relax without him running off. Our second night, Rocky suddenly let out a loud bark and was stretching his chain to the limits, we tried calming him down, but he just kept snarling and growling toward the deep woods. We shined our flashlights all around, but saw nothing. The next day, we took Rocky on the leash and went into the woods at the place where he had been growling and barking toward. And with Rocky's nose to the ground, we walked around a football-sized area. And at one marshy point, we found a very large footprint. I mean, really big. It had to be the biggest animal I had ever imagined. The print was over 18 inches long and at least 6 inches wide. We found three prints and we both assumed it had been a monster bear. There are only black bears in the state and we know they don't get that big. We decided it was too dangerous to stay at our campsite any longer, so we packed up and went home that afternoon. As usual, we stopped to say goodbye to our friends and they said their dog had also been barking and excited the night before, so they kept him in the house. They said they thought they heard Rocky as well, but the distance was too great to be sure. Whatever it was had disturbed both dogs. 
Well, this year again, we decided to take a few days to get away, and right back to our special lake we went. On our way in, we stopped to see our friends that live by the lake, and they came out to tell us they experienced a break into their shed and back where they store tools, as well as canned vegetables and berries. Something had torn the door off its hinges, and many jars had been smashed, but nothing was missing. The sad part was that their large sheepdog had disappeared. They said they had left Barney in the shed when they went to town for supplies, and they figured he had chased away whatever had broken the door and hadn't come back yet. We said we'd watch for him and headed to our campsite. From the minute we pulled up, Rocky was acting spooked. He didn't run around barking, but just growled and slunk around as we set up camp. The whole time we were unpacking, putting up the tent and getting set up, Rocky just stayed close and occasionally just uttered a low growl toward the dark forest that surrounded the lake. Rocky stuck right by us and wouldn't even eat his dog food. He did take a couple of hot dogs, which he quickly gulped down, but he just kept watching the woods. As the sun went down behind the heavily forested mountain, Rocky suddenly jumped up, ran about four steps, and started barking at something dark moving at the opposite shore of the small lake. Whatever it was couldn't have been a bear, unless it was actually walking through the marsh on its hind legs, which the game warden told me later was near impossible. By now, we were all alarmed, so, my wife holding Rocky's leash, I moved about a hundred feet toward the shape and fired my 357 Magnum revolver into the ground. At first, the beast didn't move, so I fired again, and then it slowly walked back into the trees, apparently not as frightened as a human or normal animal would be with those explosions. That did it for us. We came home the next day and reported this to the forest department, but the person we spoke with simply said, Yes, we've heard about that particular creature, but we don't have the manpower to investigate every time we hear one of these stories. Name withheld, Minneapolis, Minnesota. My name is Jeremy. I live in Montana. I've been an outdoorsman my whole life. I've been tracked and followed by cougars, been in close unseen proximity to bears, etc., etc., my encounter happened when I was contracted to paint the interior of a new house being built in a place that was remote, but not so remote I would ever thought this would happen in the Bull Mountains. I noticed on my drive into this build that there were more turkeys than I had ever seen. It was early elk season when I started, so I had all my gear in hopes that I could sneak off and bag an elk. I was a new dad and the mortgage bubble had just hit, so I was working alone having had to lay off my crew because there was virtually no work to be had. I drove a long way to get to this job. I intended to work late and spend the night every night. Upon my arrival, the general contractor left me in charge and left. Sweet, I thought. Night one. I worked until around ten at night. I went outside and jumped in my truck, exhausted. I'm six feet tall, and sleeping in a truck cab just doesn't fit, but I was tired and wanted to crash. The nearest farm was about a mile away. I just laid down across the front seat. I was in a 2001 Dodge 4x4 with a topper full of tools. I slept like crap. I felt like I was being watched. Odd for me, as I like resting and relaxing in the woods. I woke up, made coffee, and thought, what a weird night. Why did I feel like that? Night two. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched the night before. I was all alone all day, and frankly, I obsessed over it. That night, I took a masking machine with paper and masking tape and masked off all the windows to my truck from the inside. Who would notice, I thought, out here in the middle of nowhere? If it makes me feel better in sleep, I'm doing it. Screw what my tough guy buddies say. That night, in the middle of who knows what time, I awoke to my truck rocking pretty hard. I thought, pretty good wind, it's going to snow and get cold. Well, I gotta pee. So I get out of the truck, and it's so dark, you can't see your hand in front of you, and I walk a few steps and start to go. It's at that moment I realized that it was a beautiful night, warm and calm, no wind whatsoever. There were no sounds in the woods. Odd. Why was my truck rocking like I was in a windstorm? Spider sense now on full heightened alert. What's going on? I get in the truck and go back to sleep. Night three. I can't take sleeping in the truck anymore. I must stretch out. I set up a Thermarest sleeping bag in the bottom room of the unsecured house. 
I don't feel good about it, but I must sleep. I don't think I slept at all that night. If I did not off, it was in abject fear. I had an idea what was going on. I just didn't want to admit it to myself. I felt watched all night. I couldn't find any sign inside or out the next morning. The next day, the general contractor showed up, was happy with my progress, and left me in charge again, this time with permission to use his RV parked 50 yards down the hill off to the side. Sweet, I thought. Let me inform you that I had two halogen lights. One I left by the garage door to allow me light to get tools from my truck, and one that I moved around with me to light my work area. The job site was an absolute horror show of a mess, hard to get around. So I left my truck backed up to the garage, and the driver door opened all day this day. I would periodically go out and smoke a cigarette and check my phone. I only had cell service or radio reception during the day for whatever reason. All normal until the end of the day. Night 4. At the end of the workday, around 10 again, I walked out to the truck and stood right next to the open driver's door. I could hear a clicking sound about 30 yards straight below me. I stood, smoked a cigarette, and in the open light of the halogen light, simply listened to the noise below me. I was in a canyon with rim rocks to my back, a creek bottom below me, and a slight slope with tree cover to the top of the hill on my opposite side. The road paralleled the creek at the bottom of the hill. The noise was a wood knocking sound that was quiet but regular. It was nothing like the researchers do. It was actually very quiet, about the same volume as knocking something off a wooden spoon into a pan, maybe even slightly less loud. It took a little thinking to sort it out. At first I thought it was a rancher opening a gate, but no lights, no dog, no truck, no ATV, etc., Weird, I thought. It was like no natural sounds of the woods I knew of that were not man-made. There was no way a man was doing anything out in the middle of nowhere, in complete darkness, without at least a flashlight. I listened for about a minute. It was pitch dark down there. I finally reached into the back seat of my truck, into my elk hunting pack, and broke up my call, and let out a few crappy, sleazy cow calls. This is when the crap hit the fan. I heard the stick get dropped and bounce end to end as it settled. I heard this entity run to my left around 50 yards. It then jumped the fence, crossed the road, and ran up behind me around 150 yards or more. It climbed the rims behind me and ended up on the top edge and stopped. It performed this evasion climb in a matter of time that was truly amazingly fast. I wouldn't even guess the time. Too fast is all I could think. After it stopped... It screamed at me, in a voice which I can only describe as aggressive, territorial, and terrifying. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard. Very low like bass, to very high like a hawk, with all ranges in between. It lasted just a few seconds. The volume was insanely loud. It terrified me. I knew what it was. The area was dry, compacted dirt, covered in pine needles, and with a little dry grass here and there. No tracks left I could find. In the time I heard it run, I can say it was bipedal. The sound of a man running. Nothing like the sound of a horse, cow, bear, or elk running. If a person can't hear that distinction, I submit they must live in the city or whatever. We country kids know. I never saw this entity. I know I was within 15 or fewer yards from it multiple times. The thought of me peeing while it stood behind my truck right next to me scares me to near death. For the rest of the job, I would have to finish for the day, shut off all the lights, and then walk to the RV in the dark. Not too far, but around 50 yards in the total dark. I was terrified every night. I walked with a pistol in one hand and a hunting knife in the other while wearing a headlamp. The funny thing is that I knew they would do me absolutely no good. We do what we can, I guess. I never had any interactions that contained details that were of any interest or note other than the simple fact that I could feel this entity around me at night. The feeling of being watched gave me goosebumps. It lasted for just under a month until the job was done for me. Interesting note, when I brought it up to the old brash tough guy contractor, he had nothing to say about it other than the odd uncomfortable pause. His younger brother quit the job while they were framing and he wouldn't tell me why. 
me and my best friend had an encounter with one of these things. My buddy and I became close in the Marine Corps. We've been deployed twice together, and we've been in some serious crap together too. Nothing that we've been through in Iraq has even been close to what happened to us elk hunting that day. My buddy is from the South, and during our years in the service, I used to go on and on about hunting stories from my childhood. Besides the occasional white-tailed buck, he has never shot any big game, so I promised to take him elk hunting. Well, the opportunity came, and I took him into a very remote area in southeast Idaho. It's a very rough country and remote, so you either have to hike in or take a pack string in. We took our trusty steeds. On the first day, we rode about 12 miles in and made camp. The first day and night was kind of unnerving, and the two horses and mule were acting very on edge. I just chalked it up to the first day jitters. We decided in the morning we would ride over the next ridge that overlooks good drainage that should give us good shots if the elk are out feeding. The ridge we rode to was about another three miles away from camp. We hunted all morning and didn't see anything, and we ate lunch, and the whole time we felt as if we were being watched. My buddy kept saying that he came out here to relax, and instead he can't help but feel like something is about to go down. I would play off his comments like he wasn't used to the backcountry, even though I knew something didn't feel right. Getting close to dusk, we headed back for camp. As we headed for camp, I noticed how quiet the forest became. Our horses got really spooked and snorty, and I could smell this nasty, musty pea smell. For a split second, I thought, perfect, we found some elk. Smelled nothing like elk. And then almost like a fire hydrant, this god-awful scream erupted. Our horses both reared and damn near came over backwards. My buddy and I both fell off, and there our horses go, thundering off through the timber toward camp. So, there my buddy and I are standing in the middle of a horse trail, scared crapless. I had my 06 slung across my back, so when I got dumped, my rifle came with me, and my buddy had his semi-auto 12mm. It was damn near dark, and we really didn't know what to do. Here are two seasoned combat vets that are so frightened they don't dare venture into the darkness back to camp. So we did what we had done before we were cut off. We sat on the ground back to back, armed and ready to fight our way out. We sat there in the middle of the trail back to back the whole night. During the night, we heard various whoops and hollers mixed with strange vocals anywhere from 100 to 75 yards away. Way too damn close, that's all I knew. We heard toward camp some loud noises, and all I could think is, whatever it was, has killed our horses. I wasn't too concerned about the mule. She's a nasty, mean one, and will probably kill a wolf pack if given a chance. Finally, after one of the most miserable nights, daylight finally came, and we got the heck back to camp. What we found was the mule still tied up, but the horses were nowhere to be found. But the hoof tracks were headed in the right direction for the trailer. We packed up camp on the mule. We walked the 12 miles out. When we got back to the trailer, there were our horses standing there, not a scuff on them, and all our gear in place. That was one crazy 48 hours, and I have to say I'm glad my brother was there by my side. We have fought for each other before, and we were both ready to do it again that night. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to enter the November giveaway contest. Just listen to the video linked on your screen and follow the instructions to enter. Thanks and good luck!